friends, welcome back to another very special episode of the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we look at movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, joined as always by my AI with a heart of gold and a knife of blood and co-host. Oh, it's the sweetest one you've ever done. Alex Dandino. <laughs> I was going to go with tiny ginger thing in code, but never mind. We'll leave the sweet one in. Edit, edit. No. <laughs> All right, guys, before we get started tonight, a little business. Guys, this is October. We are in the midst of our deep dive into the abyss of horror. 31 pods, 31 days. For those of you who've been with us every day so far, thank you for being the iron uh, iron people that we need. A lot of, of Chucky for you. Yeah, this is it. We're saying goodbye to uh, the Chuckster tonight, the Chuck Wagon. So it's been great. Thank you, guys. A lot of pods to come. After today's pod where we wrap up Child's Play, every day for the rest of the month will be a guest pod, a patron exclusive, or a live trip to the theater. So stay with us. Keep sharing. Keep inviting your friends, man. Let's make a party out of this and finish the month strong. Yay. Also, guys, it's happened. We are on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Film Alchemist Pod. For as little as a dollar a month, guys, you can get in. Join us in some social gatherings. Uh, get to know us a little bit. Join the community. Dip your toe in the wall to see that Dip it's so nice. Toes. And then you, you get up and we start dipping further, further, right? So as you go up the Highlander ranking system, very official. Uh, you can begin to pick the movie specifically that you want to hear us uh, discuss, man. You can force the hand, our little rubber hands, to do what you want. We will be the little dancing puppets for you. Uh, also, we have a lot of really fun stuff we're working on over there. Uh, some really cool content coming your way, guys. Again, we always are trying to work our hardest to earn those dollars. We appreciate so much those of you who support us. And for those Thanks. of you who are about to, thank you as well. All right, guys, make sure you leave us a rating and review wherever you find the pod, especially if that's be Apple Podcast app, right? A quick five star, a quick sense or two about why you like spending time with your friends, Alex and uh, Griff means the world to us, helps us fight back against the algorithmic overload. These algorithmic Chucky dolls. Yeah, those little, those little sons of bitches. We got to elbow drop them, brother. You know what I mean? Anywho, go to YouTube, subscribe to the channel, Film Alchemist. Uh, you can email the show, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. Find us on all the socials you're on. We're there as well. We're very easy to get a hold of. We're very accessible, and we love talking movies with you guys. We love to know what you think of the show and how we can make it better. So get at us. Oh, right. That's enough business. Uh, we're here for pleasure, man. This is a pleasure cruise uh, this month of October. All right, so tonight... We're rebooting, right? This is Child's Play, uh, our reboot edition. I remember when this movie came out, it took a lot of shit, right? This movie was attacked from without and within. There was mm -hmm. some some beef, right, that a lot of people in the horror community, we took it kind of personally, how much they, they kind of chiseled out Don Mancini, the heart and soul that animated Chucky for all of these movies. Yes. They kind of stole it, and they took it, and they made it different, right? And we hate different. Everyone who's in a fandom hates different. We all know that. Um, so not only that, but it just it felt different. This movie went its own way. So this was a really weird one. I, I mean, I think myself, I gave it a two and a half out of five leaving the theater. I don't think I'd maybe even thought about it since then. But when talking about getting ready for this show, I kind of started to think back. I was like, there was actually some really awesome shit in this movie. And rewatching it today, I just want to start here, Alex, with your opening thoughts. I think if we're doing the reboots of the major horror franchises, I think this might be the best one, right? If you got the if you got yeah. the flavor for Rob Zombie's Halloween, okay, sure. But I think this is better than the 2018 Halloween. I think this is better than Friday the 13th reboot. I think this is better than Texas Chainsaw's reboot. I think it's way better than the Nightmare on Elm Street reboot. I think Chucky, believe it or not, out of all Leprechaun reboot. But anywho, neither here nor there. Out of all of the major horror guys, who would have thought that Chucky got the best reboot? And perhaps 
is the perfect villain for the world we live in right now. What do you think about that, Alex? Yeah, I mean, I actually read a lot about like what happened because I was like, why? I finished the movie and I, I was like, why did people not like this? Like, this works. Yeah. Like, it's literally like, hey, maybe don't give Siri a body and we won't like totally hate life. Like, that's like kind of a lot of this. <laughs> that's a lot of what happens. But like, I looked it up and yeah, like Don Mancini and even fucking uh, Tiffany herself, uh, fucking um jennifer tilly jennifer tilly fucking went all in and she's like not my hashtag not my chucky i'm like got it yeah but um and it's not to be fair no it's not (laughs) at all i mean and i think this is definitely not this isn't the direction don mancini would have gone anyways if like if don mancini was involved in a reboot he would not have done this not even come close to it no so they did take i did notice they did take one thing he's been trying to do like I guess they did. I mean, they did it in another Chucky movie, but they like took that idea that he literally had tried to do since like child play two. But, um, I, I like this movie to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, if you stack it up against the other remakes of the classic franchises, like I really like David Gordon Green's Halloween, but that's not really a reboot. It's more just a continuation of the story. Well, that's a, that's a sequel in itself, right? That's a part two. That one is essentially the sequel to Halloween two, I believe. No, Halloween 1, right? Uh, no, no Halloween maybe two. Halloween 2. Yeah, okay. So I'm it's supposed like and it's interesting because really all of the movies that have been short actually, you know what? The other one that I think is just as good as uh if not better as Evil Dead. Short Oh of- shit. Okay. So I don't I don't consider Evil Dead when I think about my big icons of the slasher genre. Sure. But yeah, Evil Dead is to me the greatest horror movie remake of all time. But I mean, as far as like the icons of the genre yeah i think that this is probably the best one of all of them i mean yeah these towering titans of the body count and slasher right jason michael freddie leatherface get fucking taken down it's very interesting too because like this movie so this came out in 2019 and it's interesting that it took this long because this one honestly to me is like the most no-brainer remake and probably because don mancini had a stronghold over the franchise still does they're putting out that tv show on sci-fi but when they rebooted, or I guess when they, yeah, when they rebooted Nightmare and Jason and uh, Friday the 13th, those two particularly were directed by music video directors and they were under Platinum Dunes and they were through a lot of Michael Bay action. So that came at a very different time. It's fascinating to watch this movie here because it comes at a time when I think there's a huge shift in how we're looking at how reboots and remakes work Mm -hmm. and i honestly think it's probably for the better like this is a great this is a very interesting entry not into the child's play franchise but just like into its own uh story itself so yeah works for me and also i'm not shitting on the other remakes i'm actually not Not an anti-remake guy i like all of those horror remakes i talked about for the most part and I love Don Mancini and what he gave us, right? I've Same. always held that Child's Play per entry is one of the strongest horror franchises, right? Agreed. But I think you see with Curse and Colt that we're kind of going a not great way, right? The budgets are shrinking. We're getting a lot more. Di- they just they don't they don't have that extra thing that Child's Play always had, even though there's good content there. It's right. different. Well, Curse and Colt are interesting because they kind of lean out of what. I think uh, Bride and C do very well, mm-hmm. which is understanding understanding the play of what Child's Play does. Like, I liked that Don Mancini leaned into a lot, especially in Seed, of what people's perceptions of Child's Play is. Right. And I think what Curse and Cult do is shy away from that a little bit and make it more horror-y. So for, for, for lack of a better phrase, I'm not really <laughs> sure how else to put it. Like, right. I guess, I guess without enough meta injection that's probably where it comes from i prefer yeah it was kind of the first time where it felt like it wasn't swimming against the stream if that makes yeah Uh, that's a good way to put it you know like and and there's something about but that's a great place to start because i feel like the biggest disconnect in this film is that it's just not the chucky that anyone wanted right Because, I, I I mean, I agree with you. This is such a fucking no-brainer version of Child's Play to make. And I think if this was a horror movie, right, that came out as this 
small budget out of nowhere. They came up with an idea of, uh, you know, Surrey Run toy, right? A nanny cam. We used to, have, you know, teddy bears that had teddy nanny bears, cams in them. Teddy rocks. So you can yeah. find out if you're like, oh, pair was a diddler or whatever, right? Like we all saw <laughs> these many things people when did. we were at the parent store. Yeah. Or like, oh, my husband's humping the au pair, right? I guess she's a hoe pair. Great. This Now oh, my whole wow. life's ruined, right? <laughs> Low-hanging fruit. Good Lord. I, come on. Come on. If I eat fruit, which uh, you is know almost what? never, it's the low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know what? I got to give it up for Oscar Wilde, like wordplay that good. Yeah. So you're right. <laughs> but this is – so, and, and again, I'll say this up front. This movie was never going to be as cool as Child's Play. No. Right? This movie was it never can't. going to be – a serial killer voodooing himself and being the the sick play thing of this this voodoo god and that Brad Dorf face and anger and rage that we saw in the first you're never ever going it, to get that again it by ever. nature can't do it 30 years no. later it by nature is not how that's going to work right and again chucky's always had that problem he's not scary in and of itself right Ch child's play movies derive their horror from attacking norms and right. so my case would be right is that they took a relatable way to do this scary they changed the lensing at every single point right this is not exactly a new hope to a force awakens level redoing <laughs> but it's pretty <laughs> right. fucking close and then yeah. every single scene they just shift the lens enough to where we're seeing it in a fresh and new way right now we're right. doing a mice and chucky and it really works, right? <laughs> and they're still attacking the norms oh, of man. our society and our, you know, our kind of homogenized family concepts and this and that. They're still Absolutely. getting at all that. They're still attacking it. Well, they're still attacking attacking consumerism and corporatism. And you know, it's ch and, and it's Mark Hamill, so it's not like they got some like fucking I, I no name. I think that's like I it's think that's probably the biggest cool. thing is getting Mark Hamill is probably. It's fascinating because Mark, like, you know, Brad Dorif obviously came with his own iconography, but Chucky became his iconography. Like after Ch after Child's Play one, that was Brad Dorif's voice. Yeah. We all knew that, that was going to be Brad Dorif. It's interesting because Mark Hamill comes with his own, not just being Luke Skywalker, but I mean, for me, the he's Joker. the he's the Joker. Yep, absolutely. He, it, that, vo that voice comes with its own iconography, so it's weird to hear it come out of another entity and not be what it's supposed to be. But I think that's kind of smart on the. I think that's kind of smart on the filmmakers' part is simply by doing that, you have this predestined madness built in. That's a voice that we all associate with the Clown Prince of Crime. This like terror. For our child, it's a lot of people in our generation who sat down and watched their Saturday morning cartoons religiously and saw the Joker. For those yeah. of you younger viewers, Saturday morning cartoons is how a lot of us <laughs> used to watch <laughs> cartoons. Yeah. They, they, you know, they cut it out. This is a yeah. thing that I think got people riled up because I, I think the casting was met with. That's a great idea. I don't think anyone expected this because the, the biggest shift in the movie is that in this movie, the the scariness of Chucky comes from this. It's a it's a fatal attraction tabula rasa thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where Chucky is a blank slate that has one goal in mind. He wants to make Andy love him and have fun with him, right? And so this inversion of where Chucky's evil comes from is fucking awesome, yeah, right? You're I never agree. going to do it better. And so I think when they cast Mark Hamill, it's like, oh fuck. It reminded me of when they cast Jared Leto as Joker, and you're like, this is going to be cray. We just didn't know it was going to be, like, guy who vapes too much and is huffing whipped cream cans in the 7-Eleven parking lot cray. A lot of vapes, yeah. A lot of vapes, a yeah. lot of monster, a lot of whippets. Yeah. Absolutely. It's that like, was... do they make sweatpants intentionally to go right on top of your dick root, or is that a choice? You know, that kind of crazy. <laughs> and I think we expected that from Chucky. We're like, this is going to be, like, the dark, insane Joker Chucky. Right. Mm -hmm. And he played, I mean, I'm telling you, I just kept thinking of Mice and Men in this movie, right? It's just Chucky like, Andy, Andy, I'm going to tend the wabbits. Tell him. And he's like, yeah, Chucky, you're going to tend the wabbits. Ah! And then he fucking Tony Starks him. Right. And it's, you know, but that's a, that. So I think at its absolute core, this movie works so fucking well. Yeah. And I think that watching Chucky through good intentions and abuse becomes this really fucking 
perfect parallel journey to what people are going to say about Andy if he gets, you know, dimed out for all this. Right. Because Andy in this one is an older teenager who they're already like, oh, he might be a trouble kid, this and that. And so watching Chucky also have to come to to grips with these, you know, sensory inputs and just make the wrong decisions for the right reasons. Right. Is equally as scary to me, honestly. I don't disagree. I mean, this is the it's the proliferation of technology. Like I love I love the way that Chucky becomes Chucky in this movie. Like mm-hmm. that to me is we don't have like that to me is the key to this whole thing. It's the key to unlocking the ability to watch this movie without being like, man, where's the Chucky I know? Like, because that's like a really important thing about this movie is that it's not going to be the Chucky, you know, because it doesn't need to be. Everything about this comes from our perception of what toys are now. Like in 1988 and 1989, that version, like Teddy Ruxpin, those things were very important to those kids. Just like now, kids, look, oh, we have to keep the phone. We have to keep the phones and tablets away from my kid. Every child is up on their technology. My kid knows how to open my phone and look for Disney Plus or Amazon or whatever app he wants to watch cartoons on. Like, that is what plays into it is the fear that these children are know way too much than what's good for them. So for there to be yeah. a learning machine that literally learns everything about them and then can essentially do their bidding is far more terrifying than anything than just like right. a deranged voodoo doll. Well, it's scary on two levels, right? Because one, who is this child to guide this ultimately yeah. powerful thing? And also it gets to this problem that we face every day in our society where no one wants something that is but one thing, right? No. So it can't just be, here's a doll for you to play and put your imagination into the doll's got to do half of the work for your kid, right? right? And what that doll really is doing is replacing you so you can, you know, fucking try to keep pace with this new world. And I think there is this, what have we let in our homes concept of this movie, right? Oh, absolutely. And this is because Kaslin has now replaced the good guy corp, right? The good Mm -hmm. guy corp was like, we're retiring, you know, last stand style as Michael Jordan as... The best child destroyers of all time. We're going to let Caslin try to. And Caslin's more like LeBron, right? They're a little complainy. They're trying for it. But, yeah. you know, it is what it is, right? They're still great at destroying families. Well, yeah, families. like Caslin clearly <laughs> took their talents to South Beach, and now they're back in Cleveland ready to go. <laughs> and they're going to win titles. They're so going to win gonna titles. They're going to bring the same gonna conversation. Bring <laughs> yeah, they're going to win dead body child uh, content. <laughs> but this is <laughs> – but – that's what one I think of the is best funny, right? Is this plays as small soldiers? Yes. Where this is not a toy company, no. right? They make this toy as a way to integrate. So what they're essentially making, right, is this is a not very thinly veiled shot at the treating your robot like your slave, right? Because right. what Chucky's supposed to do, or Buddy, is watch your kids, raise your kids. Hand them the science book when you forget. Oh, and he can order you a car. He can run the dishwasher. So we're not, this is not a toy anymore. This is not in the first movie when Andy likes a cartoon, so mom tries to bring him home a doll. That's not what this is. And they set it up, because again, we've we've relensed this, right? So Aubrey Plaza plays younger. Andy plays older. And so we're watching this family that, you know, she said she had a productive Sweet 16, she they're they're not the happy kind of typical bonded unit that we see in these other movies like Andy and his mom in the first one that was a mom desperately in love with a sweet and totally innocent boy in this one that's not where we play and so there is a really weird moment of why she gets that doll why she brings it home and it has this undertone of she just hates that her kid is you know, it's so different to her and she can't relate to him and that he doesn't like, she sends him outside to go play with raining water lamp kids, like street lamp kids. Right. And you're like, that's not like a, as a parent, I'd be like, well, if you want to be friends with them, I'll go talk to them too. Uh, you know, cause as an adult, everyone I met in the rain under a fucking street lamp, we was up to no good. You know what I mean? Right. So she's so desperate for it. 
That's a scene I want to hone in on real fist, right? When she, when the lady brings the Chucky back, right? One, we get the first great scene where the guy's complaining he's a ginger classic. Uh, when the other lady brings it back and Aubrey Plaza zones out and doesn't even hear her like the eyes went red. This is not good. Right. What in that moment is she like, I need to bring this home to Andy? Why or what? What about what's, it? what's happening in her brain, right? Why is she like, this is I the mean, moment I need like, to bring this home? I mean, to me, that is the, de- I mean, and you know, you're a parent. We're like, that's the desperation you have to just like make your child feel okay. Like she clearly, as we find out later on, like has no problem just banging out her boyfriend on like the living room in the living room, which is weird. So, it like, was a hard make out that was probably 10 minutes away. It was Four at best, not ten. I mean, granted, that guy looks like he cannot move the goalpost, but nevertheless. Well, as we learned, Shane does not have unlimited time because he's a sack of shit. Yeah, we'll Uh, get to that. Also, yeah, parents, I'm not a divorced parent, but I do have a a wife. Um, Maybe don't throw down the Patrick Swayze style fuck fest in the foyer. But I think that that, yeah, definitely That's a a good hard and fast rule. Let's be honest. Let's just throw that one out there. The yes. sways, the sways, F to, the sways F shack is not the living room floor. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're not living in a fucking karate gymnastic barn. Yeah. Okay. This isn't, Close this isn't, <laughs> this isn't ghost. You know, there's no fucking pottery barn at the end of this, but like, I think, <laughs> yeah, you that, think Andy was messed up before. Wait till he comes in and he sees mommy's Chucky, you know, <laughs> <laughs> good Lord. <laughs> but I mean, to me, like zoning, like, not because I agree. Like that was the part I was like, why would you like, they tell you it's defective. Like you're like, cause there's a level there of like, why are you bringing your kid a fucked up toy? But like, you're so desperate to love your, to make your kid know that like you care enough about them to not like, cause clearly they've had some hard times. Clearly things have been very rough. So I think like there's a level of desperation in a mother who sees a situation she can remedy with like what she thinks is a toy worthy of her child so i felt like when she lost that woman's voice though yeah because she didn't try to take the other guy's toy back she kind of is like yeah you fucked this up she wants this doll right she zones her out and i know that we saw andy's phone and chucky was humping something and it was really funny it was great it felt strange right because she's like this fucking doll i hate this doll And Andy's a little, that's what I latched onto. I was like, is this some kind of like last ditch effort to kind of control your son? Because when she walks in the first time, Andy's, the first thing we hear Andy say is, wow, you look like shit. Yeah. And you're like, oh, so we're doing a completely different setup, right? This is a completely different origin. And I think what happens, it it does work really well, right? Um, Because whether she's right or wrong, we do see Andy form a legitimate bond with Chucky, right? So yeah. there, there is something to it. She, she obviously was right, right. And I mean, to me, like the, but the bond with Chucky is less. We'll get to that. But like the, because like to me, the bond with Chucky is the replacement for not Aubrey Plaza's character, like not not Karen in this case, because like she's like she's not an absentee mother. She's just working all the time. She's got to fucking work to pay. She's got to fucking man. work to pay the bills. Like the difference is though is like for me, this version of Chucky, the Chucky and Andy relationship in this version becomes much more like the genie in Aladdin. Like yes. this is someone who is doing your bidding, and like he's relating to you not on the level of like oh I'll give you a hug and be your friend. It's like I can provide. A valuable service, which is fucking up anyone who fucks you up. Like, that's really kind of not it where it starts. Because I think the fun thing in this, right, is the Child's Play 1 is Charles Lee Ray whispering into this boy's ear, right? This is the opposite, right? This is a kid who's like, oh, I'm going to make him scare my mom's boyfriend, whatever. Right. And then we do see some real, they're playing games together. They're laughing together. There's a real bond. The actual, the montage I really loved is when we see Chucky fucking up all of the things that the commercial uh, buddy does. And he's like, science <laughs> book. And they're like, this is toilet paper. What? And it, I thought that was kind of perfect, right? Is Because this is not the family that's shown in that commercial. This is not 
mom, dad, perfect kids, everyone healthy, rich house. Right. Buddies doing everything right. This is real world, right? Yeah, totally. Their buddy is a little clunky. They say Han Solo. He says Chucky. Right. <laughs> Which again, yeah. is this Charles Lee Ray being brought back again <laughs> against his fucking will? Can this man stop getting pink sock? <laughs> God, dude, how fucking funny. Because why did thought... he pick Chucky? You could say short... that's just a cheeky screenwriting thing. I mean, I, I will say Dumbala it's a cheeky screenwriting I mean, I will say Dumbala it's a cheeky screenwriting thing. I will say it's a cheeky screenwriting thing, but I love the idea that he, like... I love the idea that Charles Lee Ray's soul is gets sucked back into the digital age. He's like, God damn it! <laughs> and now he's just this completely, like, wiped, like, enough... Kill no. me. Very, very Brumblefly. <laughs> Kill me. Kill me, Andy. <laughs> Kill me, creepy guy who jerks off in the basement. Kill me. <laughs> right? but, but there is this really... It's funny to see the child putting the, the bad influence into the doll, right? Because one of the right. motifs in the film that right, works totally. so well to me is I love the idea of Chucky does something bad, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's strangling the cat or trying to stab them as they're watching Texas Chainsaw 3. That's kind right. of a shot at all of us horror bros, right? Horror, yes. horror ladies, right? Horror community, my fault. All of us horror peeps. When they're laughing as Chrome Dome and Leatherface are just having at him. Right. And he's like, ah, ha, 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 ha. and he's going to stab Pug to death because he D thinks yeah, it's fucking for funny. Sure. And there is something to that, right? Like, I remember when I had a, a kid, Hunter was... I mean, I still have two. I didn't, you know. Thank I was going to say, we yeah, get rid no, of one. I still have two. This is not a big reveal on the pod, guys. <laughs> I would like to think you guys would know I'd be a little more busted up. I Especially be after watching all these without, child's plays. Yeah, I wouldn't be doing yucks with Alex. Anywho. <laughs> but I, my wife came home one day and I'm feeding him his little fucking smashed up peas and banana or whatever the fuck we used to have to feed him. Right. And she go, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, what? Like, I'm I'm feeding him. Are you talking about my technique, my fucking spooning technique? What's going on? Right. And she's like, you're watching Hellraiser. And I was like, yeah. Like, I always watch Hellraiser. What's the prob? And she's like, Hunter is also watching Hellraiser. And I was like, yes, and eating dinner. What's the problem? And she got really mad. She's like, you don't think this is an issue, that your one-year-old son is watching Hellraiser? And I'm like, he doesn't know the difference between Hellraiser and Peppa Pig. Right. And that's just a gamble I made at a young age. I don't know if that's going to come back in therapy someday. Because <laughs> it never dawned on me. I'm like, this kid doesn't know what anything is. Why would that be bad? And when I saw that moment in Child's Play, I was like, holy shit, did I fucking blow it? <laughs> Six years ago, did I blow it? You know what's it? funny? We've watched a lot of movies for this, for this month. And like this pod in general, I always watch them when I'm watching my kid. And I think about that. All the fucking time. I'm like, am I fucking my kid up? Because it's interesting. Because, yeah, like, there is this. It, actually, I, I read it as this, like, oh, shit. This is, like, straight up that desensitization. Like, everything they always tell yeah. us about, like, don't watch violent movies in front of your kid. I was like, oh, shit. Like, not only have I fucked my kid up, but, like, like I don't really fuck my kid up in that way. But I've also, like, completely deadened their sense of, like, true terror. Because Chucky gets alarmingly close before everyone's like, Oh, this is fucked up. Because this is they can't fathom that he could hurt them. No. Right? But, but that's but the not, thing. Imagine yeah. seeing their reaction to something like that on the TV and not having the 15 years of it's bad to hurt people. Right, right. Because they're kids. They're not worried about parenting him and, you know, fucking foisting lessons and morality into him. They're right. having fun having him say dick turd and whatever. Right? <laughs> as as I would have done too, right? Right. Totally. And so no, totally. There, there is this... You know, who's running the asylum thing, right? right? And, you know, I saw that a lot when I was... Because when we were growing up, we weren't always the best off. But I knew other friends of family and this and that. And it was just kind of kids raising kids a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Because parents had to work. Absolutely. You know, and there that, that scene really stuck up. But that's what this movie does well, right? Is I think the watching Chucky earnestly try his best and still fucking fail, right? This gets back to that... There is still somewhat of a supernatural hand, it feels like. Like, he had no choice but to I be mean, this guy. Yeah. That, like, one of the scenes I fucking... Or the motif I was going to get to before I derailed myself is I love when Chucky does something bad and Andy's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. 
And he just plays back his own words to him. I wish yeah. you weren't here. I wish you'd leave us alone. And he's like, what's the problem? You asked for this and I gave it to you. Right. It's, it, it is this like crazy monkey's paw situation. Absolutely. Where he, like, keeps, yes. he absolutely keeps wishing for these things. Like he unintentionally, but it's like you were saying, like this is the tabula rasa version of Chucky where it's like, it's a learning machine on top of, yeah, probably a little bit of not greatness. I mean, cause <laughs> here, here, right before the, uh, the Vietnamese man who totally fucks with the Chucky doll, uh, pulls a, you know, Apple computers. Um, I, uh, I am pro those workers, right? I feel horrible for the weak workers that work in sweatshops. And I feel bad that I buy products that maybe have been made that way. Sure. I do have a base level question. Why does someone on the line have access to the munitions? I will chips? click the murder <laughs> button on these dolls because <laughs> we it's, find out at the end that's not the only one. That felt yeah. like a direct shot at Apple, right? Because I remember they had the they were putting nets around their dormitory story. Well, it's uh, like the, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like that, and then the <laughs> the other thing I thought of when I was watching that, yeah, like. The t I honestly, the small soldiers thing I kept coming back to is that scene. Dude, because exactly you put mu munitions chips in toys? I'm like, yeah, yeah, made them good. But, like, but here's this is my this is why I bring this up is right after he like fucks with it and turns the murder button on, there's a fucking lightning strike, which might, in my, I know it might be like a throwback or like a toss to like what we originally, how we originally got Chucky, but. I think there's some credence to what you're saying, which is the supernatural does creep in a little bit. I think there is yeah. ill intent, not just like, not just a murder weapon, because I think that's a really fascinating thing about this version of Chucky, which is that Chucky's not just a malintentioned, malintentioned voodoo doll. There is this element of wish fulfillment that comes with him arriving as it did in the original. But in this version, the wish fulfillment is so constructed by Andy's complacency, by Andy's offhanded comments, anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's this, it's not even be careful what you wish for. It's like, be careful what you wish for. And also be very careful what you say. Like it's, right. there's also yeah, like that episode that's a, uh, that's in the twilight zone movie. The kid who literally like says stuff and it becomes a thing. Like I, I, I was struck this time by like how much it had to do with Andy's not Andy's joy. Even it's Andy's it's all about Andy's wish fulfillment. It's all about what will make Andy's life better. Not about like being best friends. Cause he keeps coming back to like be my best friend, but really what it is is what will make Andy's life easier. Do I fucking, I mean well, my fate that, that definitely gets perverted a lot. Yes. Right. Because it starts with this. I, I like your point about the lightning strike at the factory. Because I thought that too. Right. This guy just walks up and starts fucking slapping employees. And he's like, you're going back on the street. Finish this doll and then fuck you. Yeah. And I love the idea that he, you know, unsafety locks it. And that as that lightning strikes, we see him fucking jump off the roof and kill himself. Right. That's how fucking dire this thing is. Right. Behind that fucking Kaplan 1984 commercial, right? We're, uh, we're just making everyone better, except for our fucking employees, right? And that he sends that because they cut to this close-up of the buddy on a yeah. forklift pallet. Almost as if he watched this guy do it. Yeah, yeah. And it's almost as if he is somehow in his very programming, right? Or maybe supernaturally, has brought this guy in, and this is an absolute fuck you to the American family that they're selling that shit to. Oh, yeah. He just happens to find the American family that doesn't need to be fucked with anymore. Right. I mean, I wish there is this, like, this is the reason that I think this movie does so well, too, uh, as, like, a companion piece for the original Child's Play, is that it does everything that Don Mancini put together for the original Chucky, like, questioning consumer goods, questioning our perception of children and con children as consumers. Mm -hmm. It's all relevant now, even more so. And it does such a good job of slapping American consumerism in the face, just like the original child's play does. It's just as it's just as pressing and is just as throttled the entire movie. Like mm -hmm. every opportunity that they get in this movie to say, man, 
we need to fucking put the devices down, guys, is just like, like Chucky's glowing finger, the E.T. finger to turn on the fucking TV. It's like, it's not that hard to just like pick up a clicker and do it yourself. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating to me that but this it, doesn't. That's yeah. the power dynamic, though. They want that. That's a. Because, again, in the first film, we see Andy watching TV, wearing merchandise. Oh, my God, he's becoming a doll. And that was one of the fears, right, is that these cartoons and video games would rot us and turn us into these hollow little automatons, right? Right. This one is different where we've kind of already done that to ourselves as a society, right? In watching – because this, this is the funny thing, right, is that you watch Chucky in this. And I – I don't want to say that this one actually is more streamlined and focused than the first one, but I think a lot of the beats they go for actually thematically work much better, right? The first one is an absolute just powerhouse film, right? There are just things that work so well and we're attacking innocence and there's yeah. great filmmaking. Thematically, this movie is stronger, right? I, I don't disagree. I Instead of Andy being the child who just happens to find a serial killer doll, right? Right. We are watching Andy and by proxy unsupervised children uh be become like, that through their own Lord of the Fly right. style decisions. Like literally turn this like it's interesting because this movie literally takes it makes every kid, including Andy, Chucky. Like mm -hmm. all of the all of the terror and fear of being younger and being influenced and being having to deal with stuff beyond your beyond your years so on and so forth like Andy does a lot in this movie all gets funneled into this you know unfortunate uh unfortunate AI machine this learning computer that literally says well I can handle all this like it's almost like I said it's yes. it's, a, it's a monkey's paw genie and all that's kinds a of great shit. point because one of the things I had to stop and take in a mat because this is a super processing computer, right? Mm -hmm. And when Andy's not around, that fucking AI is still working really fast and he still has access to the cloud. Totally. What is Chucky thinking and learning when Andy's not there? Right. So to your point, this is a what are the inputs? What are you know, if he's doing the equation? Right. What are the fucking values that he is adding into that equation? And we start to see him make horrifying calculations. One of the first scenes where I was like, oh, my God, this is working exceptionally well for me. So he kills the cat. Right. Yeah. He breaks out of his confinement. He comes home. He kills the cat. He's like, the cat hurts you. The cat's the reason I'm in here. Right. Because we don't get along. Right. Now we can play. And you follow that computer logic and you're like yeah like that's a logical place to go absolutely because they didn't sit him down from day one and instead of scaring the boyfriend say hey um this is morality right here's a you know grim's fairy tales or whatever be afraid like the rest of us and live better they don't do that the scene afterwards though so andy and him hide the corpse somehow and there's right. two more cat moments that come along, and it's like, oh, my God, this says all of it. Mm -hmm. When Andy wakes up and Chucky's watching him cowering in the shadows because he knows he's done wrong, but he doesn't know why. Right. And he's playing back audio of the cat meowing, and it sounds like reliving its death, right? Yeah. So is that him thinking that he's comforting Andy? Is that him letting Andy know, I'm the fucking, I'm the boss now? Or is that him gleaning pleasure from that sound? Oh, it's That's totally. a horrifying I mean, plethora I think of it's, decisions. I think it's absolutely relishing in your kill. Because, and I mean, on is, some level it has to be, right? But I do well, feel like he's still trying to, he wants Andy to be there with him. But see, I think that like, it's a soothing thing for it's it's a, it's unintentionally supposed to be like for me it's him relishing in the kill for one because he sees all these kids who literally sit there and gleefully enjoy you know Texas Chainsaw 3 and he's like oh this is fun for them so he's mimicking that behavior and saying this is nice for me too 
But then on top of that, it is this fucked up way for him to soothe Andy by like fake meowing like the cat because he's sitting there being like, I did it. I took care of it. That the sound you hear, that's all me. Like, it's not a boss thing. What it is is him saying like, I will take care of you. This is the sound of me taking care of things. And, and right. I think it's probably some of all of that, but he cannot understand how fucking horrified I was imagining. And I was like, that's one of those moments that just kind of slides past you. Mm -hmm. And when you stop and think about that moment, I was like, that's as good as any moment in this whole fucking franchise. That moment yeah. is fucking brilliant. It's awesome. Yeah, right. Totally. And then later we find he saves the fucking cats collar. So when he killed the cat, I'm assuming Andy knew, Hey, I better hide all the evidence. Andy has to clean up blood. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Chucky's probably also helping clean up a crime scene. This is intense, right? Yeah, yeah. Somewhere between then and now, he went back to find the corpse and take that fucking collar. And what did he do when he was with the corpse? And then he brings it back and he's using it to fucking hang that crime upon Andy. So there's a, there is this growing level of because this is one of those funny things, right? It gets back to a classic trope of the Child's Play series, which is Charles Lee Ray like, I need a body. But he does everything in his power to not just go get a body. He could just get right. a body anywhere. Any, anywhere. At any time. And he just keeps not doing it because he's playing. Right. And so we see Buddy's mantra become a lie. We see Buddy knowing that this is not for fucking Andy anymore. And we see this with Shane. In, because this movie just has top-notch kills, right? They're oh, beautiful. my God, dude. The Shane so, kill is my favorite by far. Shane is this weird mix of pumpkin patch, butt Christmas lights. We find out he's a cheating sack of shit after he tried to tough talk Andy. But this scene is really pivotal for Chucky. And this is, again, why I think I was like, okay, they know what they're doing, and this is working. Right. Because Chucky takes him out, and he's like, no one fucking hurts Andy. Okay, again, following his childlike black and white everything is this or that logic mm -hmm. this guy was gonna hurt andy this guy's been Absolutely. making andy's life miserable fine 100 percent. so he attacks him right the guy's about to be pulped by the mulcher that they used to smash pumpkins i guess yep um and he's after you know, by the way by the after that fucking oh. horrifying leg break oh I my god about that and the two oh. kids who don't know what's going on Just because don't they have their own oh yeah events. we didn't we brought this yeah so he's a shit bag because he's uh actually has a real family and he's just banging out karen and just like tough talking her kid and being and a tough big, talking your kid like he's so he some really sort of just actual comes parent. in to get it wet and ruin andy's life yeah and then goes so, home and he's like i'm a super dad Fuck to him. be fair Chucky's very justified in this, but no, no, no. no one that gets killed in this movie. Well, that's not true. Almost no one who gets killed in this movie. Do we feel bad for at all? True. And that's part of the turn is once Chucky starts killing people we like, then we are, Oh, he's a bad guy. Yeah. But so the guy gets his dome ripped off kind of accidentally. Such right? a, such a good fucking. So good, dude. Brilliant. It lands on the lawn. No, right. Yeah. And Chucky sits there and has to take it in. And we watch the serial killer form, right? The guy who yeah. can't feel empathy, pain, or anything right. like that. Now it's a serial killer. Now Chucky's like, oh, I got cheated. Right. And Chucky takes two, because that's, again, if that had happened and he didn't stab him, that's a perfect crime. No one thinks well, it's anything more than an accident. When Chucky dives in and stabs him 13, 30 times, whatever they yeah. say... That is Chucky now taking gleeful pleasure. That's a crime of passion. That's yes. serial And killing. that no longer is following his primary directive, right. which is I'm protecting Andy. No, you're not. He's already dead. You're stabbing him because right. you want this. Well, you know what's interesting about that, too? And I just this just dawned on me is this version of Child's Play is actually this ironically like the origin of charles lee ray in a lot of ways like you and i read it like i keep coming back to like we've read um i don't even remember if we talked about it on the other pod we used to do long box sessions but my friend Dahmer, mm -hmm. which is this amazing comic book um is a lot about the origins of um jeffrey Dahmer and of how he became ended up becoming you know the prolific serial killer we all know and end up being but like this is almost slyly 
the creation of a serial killer. And like when we meet Charles Lee Ray in the first child's play, he's already been a serial killer. We just know he's a strangler. This is almost like a sneaky reboot slash origin story for the creation of not necessarily Charles Lee Ray, but Chucky, the murderer itself. I it's absolutely genius. agree with you, right? Because that's the thing. Everything in this movie is actually a really clever wink back to the original. They just kind totally. of flip it. Because yeah. Chucky in this one is what we're told serial killers are. They see everything as black and white. They don't have mm -hmm. compassion. They don't have empathy. They just follow their their uh, inner voice, their pleasure, their dark passenger, right? Right, right. That's kind of what Chucky's doing. That's exactly what thing, Chucky's right? doing. What happens when you have one derivative or one directive and it's blocked from you, right? Mm -hmm. What happens? What do you become, right? Once you they take that away, what's clicking there in the darkness? And this is absolutely a serial killer movie, right? Totally. Chucky is played, and this is, this gets back to the nature nurture, right? I think they tell us in the film that had they done a better job with Buddy or Chucky or Han Solo, whatever his name was going to be, I don't think this is how this goes down, even if the guy turns off the safeguards. I think yeah. that's an important throwback is that they are, in this one, somewhat responsible. Oh, I wouldn't, 100%. I wouldn't say negligence in any way i don't think they did anything wrong it's not negligence but it's, they don't they are responsible they are the ones who fill him with the input he's responsible for filling he's responsible for filling chucky with the information to yeah help andy live his life so and facto, they don't have this, the safety net of the company saying oh we'll stop it when it goes too far right there's no there's none of that i mean again it's it's just the perfect it's the perfect metaphor for just how technology runs away from us, but also how not necessarily how impressionable not just our kids are, but well, I guess actually impressionable our kids because then by that by that sort of um by that sort of like just law of transference, like Chucky essentially becomes Andy's kid. Mm -hmm. And by like doing that, he influences Andy with his actions, with his requests, with his with all Whatever he decides to do, whether it's to say, what the fuck is wrong with you or to thank him or like be his friend or sit with him and that kind of stuff. Like you are, you know, all our children are blank slates. The way we react to them and the way we react to the world around us and show them how to do it is what creates a little person. Mm -hmm. And this is no different when you're creating like a AI murder doll. It's right. And it's again, it's cool. It's. That's why Of Mice and Men is one of the greatest books of all time. Yes. Is because we always will respond to something innocent and pure that doesn't know better becoming evil. And mm -hmm. I think you could argue that Chucky, before he gets opened up to see what makes him tick, mm -hmm. is mostly doing things for the right reason and doesn't fully understand why this other bad thing keeps happening, right? Right. And you see it play, and that's what makes it horrifying. When he brings Shane's face home on a watermelon with oh. a present bow, right? That's the extra yes. detail. So there is this creepiness where Chucky's adding his own parts and doesn't realize why they're bad. But it's like when a cat brings you a dead bird on your doorstep, and you're like, that's fucking gross. Stop it. And he's like, but I provide food. I provide <laughs> the sustenance, right? I don't know why right. the cat's like an Italian, whatever. But an Italian Makes kitty sense. cat. He, he's a dessert in this. They better not pluck He's a dessert in this. Pluck the feather. You like eats. But especially like a weird like. So that you, like it, you like it eats. The, the cat gets on his vest, but he's like, I'm going to go hit on your girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just throw all the cliches in there. But there, there's this. this God damn. I mean, it's, it's just interesting to watch that. Right. That of mice and men thing play out. They yes. even have the of mice and men scene, right? For those of you who don't know, have not read of mice and men. I promise you, if it doesn't seem like it'll be your jam, it very fucking it much very will. much is. And again, I I got it like farm hands and old timey shit. That is easily one of the most powerful books you'll ever read. It's fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. But they had the fucking Lenny scene in this movie. Come yes. on, Chucky, we can play. They let him out of the closet. He's like, "You put me in the closet. I don't like that, Andy." He's desperately pleading, like fucking help me be with me like let's talk let's figure this out i'm a super processor they bring him in the room and just fucking thump him in the back of the head and they jump on him he's like andy help they're hurting me because he has not realized that he's not a friend 
that he is a fucking servant and a tool and a, you know, he's there to do what Andy wants. He's not his fucking friend. And they fucking rip his ass up and throw him down the chute. And then we get another really cool wink and nod to the original where he is summoned back to life in this fucking doll's body. Very much like Charles Lee Ray, now fully undone. And he wakes up just in time for the fucking uh, yellowed wife beater jerker offer guy who's like, let's open you up. And he's running the drill. And you're like, no fucking wonder this thing's going to want to fucking murder. Yeah, everyone. of course. Yeah. Like, I get it. and But this is also when he starts embracing the cool element of, oh, I can control all this shit. Like, you guys have let yeah. me in, right? You've opened Pandora's box without knowing it. There's just, there's so many beautiful thematic elements yeah. to this movie, I think. I mean, there's a lot of just, like, I love, you know, there's, there is an unsung hero for the, in this movie. Not just because he actually ends up being the hero of the movie, but uh, I love Brian Tyree Henry. Like he's amazing in Atlanta. He's amazing in like literally everything he does. Um, he's so well cast in this movie. Like yeah. I, I, and again, it's one of the, it's one of those things where I, it's one of those things where I'm just like I'm in awe of anytime he does this. And this is like to me, oddly not something I expected him to be in, and yet he's just, he just gets it. Like he gets what he's doing automatically, and like. <laughs> When he's fucking watch, like when the kids uh, call him a narc, he's just like fucking millennials. Like again, <laughs> that's just like I'm like that's perfect beat. Like that's a perfect beat. But yeah. he takes like for me, he like he does such a good job taking us to the end of the movie. Like and then just like you know the winning the day thing is whatever it is what it is. But like I love his. I love the way he puts like everything together. He has like the best reaction of all of us of all of us. To the scalping, which he's just like, he fucking knows it too. He sees the guy's wallet and he's just like, yeah, I don't think he's working late. It's like, oh shit, this guy knows. Like there yeah. is. I mean, he's he becomes the heart of the film at a point because there is a clunky bit where Chucky now is hiding out with Omar and he's yeah. kind of playing this cat and mouse game. In a weird way, he's somewhat framing and isolating Andy. And it, it works, but it's just, it plays out a little clunky. The steps of it are kind of clunky. Yeah. But then we go have dinner with Detective Mike and his mom, Doreen. Mm -hmm. And it's fucking awesome. It's this nice little respite. And you're like, oh, this is why what's happening with Chucky is even worse. is because Andy's got some good shit here, man. These people will help take care of him. And they're showing him a path. Like, he can still, you know, get out of this fucking thing. Right. And I lost my shit when they went after Grandma Doreen. Like that, and I guess she's not a grandma, but, the, you know, Doreen, the mom, right? I was so yeah. fucking mad and incensed with rage that one, because she finally trusted the car. She was just going to bingo. I was like, all the bingo friends that are like, hey, it's Doreen. I'm like, where the fuck are you? And she's Tokyo drifting around the parking lot. <laughs> Hobble your asses over there and pull her out. But not only that, the indignation of Chucky getting in the car and playing with her, right? The peekaboo. Because now he's developing a serial killer MO. Now yeah. he's getting a Pinocchio heart again, as it were. And I hated it. I did not want her to die because she is nothing but a ray of sunshine and warmth. She's a and lovely goodness. woman, and it's just like, but see, this is. That's when it's is... bad, though, because Chucky's killed someone who's not a fucking diddler. Right. Chucky now <laughs> officially. Chucky, Chucky now officially is a serial killer because he's just killing for sport. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is like the – that's the apex. That's the apex of the – that's the apex of the moment where we all know, like, okay, cool. Like, this is no longer a situation where, like, we have to feel any any which way about it. Like, Chucky's no longer, like, killing cats yeah. or, like, you know, two-time and husbands. Well, he's now fucked someone's this grandma. This is not Lenny where he killed a bad man and we feel bad for him because Lenny has a gray heart. This is – Oh, he gets to go. Yeah. Fuck this guy. Because right after that is when we see Detective Mike come upon his mother's crime scene. And it's it's this strangely just gut-wrenching moment in this movie, which you absolutely don't expect. It's very cheeky and yeah. kind of fun. And that's just a moment where you're like, oh, my God. They're actually reminding us of the yeah. stakes of this movie. That 
You know, because I, I don't think there's anyone else in the film you care about or are worried about. No, not at all. When that this hit, is... it, and you watch Detective Mike's world crumble like that, yeah, it's fucking brutal. Because before we're doing the fun and games, like, oh, you gave my mom a package? Oh, I'll put the hand on the dead body evidence. It's kind of a fun and, fun and games thing. But when he sees that, right, now it it matters more, man. And I think that's a really necessary moment to keep us propelled in the film. Because you can only do the fucking jokes for so long before Chucky has to become more sinister than just implied right. Well, psychological and they finally, damage. they finally do, you know, we get, I think it's interesting because this is where, like, to me, the heartbeat of the movie kind of, like, pumps a little softer. Because then we start to, like, the third act is very much this, like, lead up to what I consider, like, this is probably the weakest part of the movie for me. Actually, it's I not think even that, close. It's not good, right? That, like <laughs> the ending of this movie does not work for me on a couple of levels, but mainly because like they do a really cool thing. Like I love like I love like the Chucky Madhouse. That is like one of my fa- that is that is like I know that's a thing Don Mancini always talked about is like multiple right. Chucky's and doing all that shit, which is cool. But like really, what happens is like you lead up to what I think is ultimately like doesn't work is he's just so unkillable at a certain point. And I'm like, how many times does this character have, how many times does Chucky have to get like hit struck finally shot? But like, it takes him like pulling his head off. I'm like, you could have done that three times ago. Well, it's not like, even, yeah. Cause they get the copier scene from office space, right? Yeah. Where they gather around him and beat the copier's ass. Yeah. It's so but weird. It's, it's not even that, right? Like it's just, they just miss on so many levels. Cause and that's the thing. The moment that sends us into the third act is fucking awesome. And it's when Aubrey Plaza is like, oh, my God, my son's losing it. Yeah. And she comes home and sees him attacking the TV. And there's a push in on her where you watch a woman's world crumble and she's like, fuck, I messed up. Like, I have unleashed a, a kid who is now bad and evil and I'm fucking scared. Right. And I was like yes they're giving us that they're giving us doreen and mike i'm like oh my god the emotional payoffs yeah. are huge and then in a store full of chuckies as you said instead of dealing with you know this body autonomy and am i special and there's a whole store full of chuckies we do a little bear gag and razor blade drones yeah i mean the razor blade drones is in a movie that is so good across the board, that's a fucking huge miss. That is yeah, a fucking I, huge miss. <laughs> I just feel like, yeah, for like a lot of these really great, up until that be- those beats, mm. we have all this great emotional, all this great emotional payoff, all this great emotional stuff that's happening that's going to, we're, like you said, we're all like, yes, give me this ending. Oh my God, it's going to be just incredible. And it ends up really kind of, devolving into what I think we expected. Like this is, I think the thing that is most disappointing about the ending is everything about this movie has been unexpected to this point. Yeah. Not necessarily in the way that, um, in the way that it's been plotted, but just in the way that it's been handled, you're like, Oh wow. This is like really yeah. its own thing. It's taking on a life of its and own. It's so working and it's right? really yeah. working thematically mm-hmm. narrative. wise, like everything. And for the movie to kind of devolve into just like action horror set piece, yeah, is a little disappointing, and I think that's the only that is like the one but knock not, I have for the not movie. Not unusual for, I mean, because I would say Bride of Chucky's giant set piece at the end is fantastic, and same with the first. But mm-hmm. two, three, they seed right. They all kind of start to fall into these. We got to get well. I mean, I guess it's really but, just two and three have these really big like. We're in a toy factory. Oh, we're in a carnival. Right. And they're just we like, all, all right. They sort of, those devolve into this sort of like, we got to end this movie. How do we end this movie? It's like this killer doll. And I think that that's kind of, it cheapens the experience, but not enough where I didn't full, I it, it didn't ruin the movie the way that I think for some people it might have. I think that this movie works really well until that yes. point. So, well, I think you me, have to do the math, right? If I get an hour of awesome child's play, that's relensed into something that's its own thing. We've seen a lot of Chucky, right? right? This is a new fun version, right? And the kills were fantastic. So if you get an hour of that, and then at the end we do stupid fucking razor blade drones and 
He hangs Aubrey Plaza and, you know, the kill is so fucking kind of fast and doesn't matter. And then we just kill him three more times. And it's it's just let's let's call it what it is. It's just a shitty ending. Yeah, it's not a great ending. It, but again, that's the hardest part of every movie, man. And what would this movie have done that really they set us up for the sequel? And it's just it's really sad because I think and again, I don't think the movie ending is exceptionally shitty. I think it's just they had done so much good yeah. stuff above expectation. It fell down to they did correct something, though. I don't know if you noticed. I love in this one that they correct the biggest sin of the series, which is not killing that dipshit middle manager in the first one. <laughs> so in this yes. one, not only is she like, oh, I'll do what I yes. want because I know you fuck people. You beat cheeks in the warehouse. <laughs> Secondly, at the end, when he has to put on the Chucky doll, he just gets his fucking throat sliced. Yeah. And I was like, finally, the, do- the middle manager had to get it twice, yeah. right? Because that first guy escaped in one of the all-time <laughs> horror blunders. But anyways, okay, to wrap this up, I think this is a really fun, shockingly well-made, and thematically stronger reboot than a lot of these, right? It just I works. Agree. I think that... Chucky starting as innocent and finding evil is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this, right, because this is our last child's play, right? So we see from Charles Lee Ray to the Chucky we all fell in love with Mm -hmm. through some really fucking weird kind of pornographic Chuckies to very pornographic The we're still trying to chug Chuckies out to AI. uh, I'm taking care of the Wabbits, George, Lenny. Uh, Evil Baymax, Hal 9000, Chucky. Right, right. Just walk me through your final. What has this child play series? What's been awesome about covering this? I mean, ultimately, these movies play into the fear we all have as children more than anything. It's this like joy and fear. Like you think about like the inversion of child's play is Toy Story. To be honest, like that's really kind of like where that comes from. So for me subverting that like you know i don't know if i'll necessarily do it on purpose but at some point i'll show my kid these movies and i'll be like see be nice to your toys but like (laughs) did i ever tell you what my mom did by the way no so my mom knew we were scared of this right because my father who was you know a bit of a cared a little bit more about his bar friends than his children kind of guy he let me watch this when i was five years old and it fucking scarred me i think i mentioned this in the first pod yeah, yeah. And I had to run upstairs and watch Puff the Magic Dragon in my grandma's room a couple times till I stopped crying and having a nightmare. <laughs> well, my mom, and I love my mom. She's a listener. She was our first patron. She's the sweetest lady who's ever walked the earth. Bless you, Zana. But was not above using a creepy doll to set in the kitchen, per se, so we wouldn't run in the kitchen. My mom weaponized my dad's shitty parenting. <laughs> And child's play against us. Zayna knows what's up. Zayna knows. Zayna knows, Respect on Zayna's name. Well, I think that's one of the things I take away from this series, right? Because I have only known child's play as a young man, right? And so I think I look at it more from the perspective of the younger characters, right? And the child and knowing it's it's that punk rock vibe, right? Like, I got something to say and I know it's true and no one fucking listens to me because I'm not part of the, like, structures of our, you know, society. I think this time it was really fun to watch it from the perspective of a parent and someone who's in charge of a young life. Definitely. And I think the horror of this film is I think every one of us who's a parent has had that thought, right? You look at your kid, do something that's off or weird. And you're like, did I do that? Did I fuck them up? Is my kid going to be an investigation discovery show? Are they going to be interviewing (laughs) me? Like how the fuck did you not know that your son had eaten 85 toes over five States? And you're like, Oh shit. I mean, I guess I should have that one time. So I was having, yeah, fucking bananas and Hellraiser. I should have seen it coming. I was like, am I going to be chapter two of the 10-part Netflix series that should really be a two-hour movie? Anyways, that's a different diatribe. But yeah. watching it as an adult, you get a lot more of that. It's there. It really works from both directions. It does. There's. I think that ultimately you just – you have to watch these – when you watch these movies, the fear that it preys on is ever-present. And it's right. unwavering and it never and while it might change, it never goes away. And I think that's what makes Child's Play actually probably one of the better horror series that we've covered on the show. Oh, I mean, this is the fucking weird thing. And I did not expect to be saying this when we covered it. And I've seen all these movies a bunch. 
Child's Play has the most interest. Oh my god, that was my dog. I thought a fucking Chucky was coming. It was to Child's me. Play. Chucky. Holy was back there. shit, Bear, you bastard! No, play with All right. me. If I die of a heart attack from being fat, I hope this is millions of downloads <laughs> later. Anywho, <laughs> but what I did not expect. Right, is that Child's Play has the most interesting shit to say of all the major horror franchises. Agreed. Right, and I guess you could say Scream, but Scream is talking about itself. Scream, yeah. Scream is a meta narrative. Like you yeah. can't lump that in like that. And what Child's Play is doing is it's saying everything that we hold is an absolute pillar of our society mm-hmm. that keeps the fucking gears moving is potentially inviting death and destruction upon us and our children. And that nothing's ever safe. And it's more than anything, our sanity and reality and our trustworthiness is not safe. Um, And again, I can't, I also think you just can't wrap it up without saying Charles Lee Ray just gets a run, dude. And not only, not only because he's awesome and Brad Dorff's awesome and Mark Hamill was honestly awesome. Yeah. But because Charles Lee Ray is this fucking George Bailey serial killer who just (laughs) is just getting fucking. (laughs) George Thanksgiving turkeyed killer. into this fucking little doll. Bless it. And having to come to grips with his life of fucking crime and sin and, you know, still hanging on or do I become a daddy? Like, right. I mean, this motherfucker's got an arc, like a big ass multi movie. I mean, this is like Marvel Universe level arcing. <laughs> Even, I mean, Chucky has a better arc than everyone in the Marvel Universe, I would argue, but. It's it's a big fucking story over a lot of these movies. Right. And if you're willing to dive beyond the ludicrous uh kind of turd in the punch bowl of the at the core of this is that it's a stupid fucking doll. Ev- almost everything about this series has always worked for me and always will. I don't disagree. That's it. No more child's play. I honestly will miss our time uh Yes, we will play with you, Chucky. Uh, I will miss this. I thought Child's Play reboot was awesome. I can't wait Me to too. get more Child's Play, man. I, if they did a sequel Same. to this reboot, if they just did more Mancini Child's Play, I'm excited I love for it. all of it. Oh, what I'm really excited about, though, guys. Now we're gonna just fucking drop guests on your head every oh day. Oh my god, I'm so yeah. excited! So for the rest of the month, guys, we've got two patron exclusives. So. Film out or patreon.com slash film alchemist pod for as little as a dollar a day. You can join the community and see if it's for you. Once you decide it is you're in, right? So I have two horror movies. It'll be exclusive over there. If you're a patron, you still have time to get your votes in for what those may be. We have three movies in the theater, right? That we're going to cover uh, new yep. stuff. And then guest, Halloween kills guest, last guest. night in Soho and antlers. Yes, and then it's just awesome guests for the rest of the month. Amazing lineup. They all brought awesome movies. I yes. cannot wait for you guys to see what we have in store for you. So, as always, every October, thank you guys for staying with us. 31 pods in 31 days. We love it's you. It's a lot of work for us. We also understand it's a lot for you guys, too. And the support you show us means the world to us. Uh, thank you from the bottom of our little black hearts. All right, guys, remember, five-star rating and review, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com and socials to get a hold of us. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, Film Alchemist. Go to patreon.com slash filmalchemistpod. Join our growing community over there, guys. I think you're going to have a good time with that and help craft this show into what you want to be. More than anything, enjoy all of these awesome guests we have coming up. Amazing guests. Bye!